All right, let's go ahead and get on started on here. Uh, just make sure you guys sign in for the Google form, get y'all's attendance, get your points for the spring formal at the end of the year, at the end of the semester. All right, awesome, awesome. Everybody good on the attendance? Everybody scan it? Perfect. Keep it up there for just a bit. All right, so we're gonna go over uh, Nathan's presentation, kind of going more uh, blast to the past, so to speak, on what we did previous semesters, you know, just kind of keep it a little fresh, what's going on currently, uh, going over some of the markets, uh, going over what's going on in the economy, as well as mergers and acquisitions. And then of course, the sweet spot. First and foremost, any outperforming moments? I know I have one, but I'm gonna save it just for, you know, second. Anybody want to go first for outperforming moments, something going on, uh, moved up on an internship, acquired an internship, or I have already, you know, held down a position on an internship. Anybody want to go first? Any takers? Any takers? Any takers? Any takers? Going once. Going once. Luke, go ahead. I have not gotten denied for my internship yet. I have not gotten denied. That's good. Uh, I guess I'll go second. I actually went forward um, with the Federal Reserve, so I'm actually going to do a, a video call with them uh, during spring break. One more. Anybody have one more? One more outperforming moment that they have? Yes, sir. I went first. Awesome. How did it go? You, did you think you did pretty good? Um, For a first? It wasn't the wasn't same. Awesome, I awesome. Like, awesome, yeah, I mean, of course, first, I mean, first time, that's pretty, I remember I did my first in, uh, interview, I was pretty dang nervous, uh, I was stuttering a decent amount, <laughs> but awesome, you know, awesome. Yeah. One more, awesome. I have nice, nice. Congrats. All right, now let's go over to Nathan with the presentation for this week. All right, guys. Uh, like one said, it'll be short and simple this week. I know it's the week before spring break. Uh, this is a pretty interesting quote I found. Derivatives are financial weapons of mass destructions. Uh, we'll cover derivatives a little bit in a couple weeks, but if you don't know what you're doing, probably going to lose all your money. If you do know what you're doing, you can make a lot of money. So that one, Warren Buffett, obviously he knows what he's talking about. Um, so investment society throwback. A little bit like last semester's model, last year's model. We're going to be breaking down market outlook, economic perspective, M&A. Uh, Luke is actually going to cover AI. It's a really interesting topic. And then just some upcoming events and news from the finance world. Uh, so first we have market outlook. So just quick overview, starting with the S&P. Uh, it's continued a strong performance over the past 12 months. Uh, hit an all-time high for the first time in two years and closed at 5,000, about just over 5,000 basis points. It has been on a really strong surge. Uh, if you read Professor Sweet's blog that myself and some of the others in the room contributed to, we cover things like the S&P, like the 10-year yield, like world markets, anything like that. Uh, so a lot of the stuff that we cover in this presentation is also on the blog. So I highly encourage you all to go check it out. Uh, just look up Professor Sweet's Musings and you'll see the blog right there. We also have the 10-year treasury up there, just a quick graph of it. Uh, last week, it fell about eight basis points just because of interest rate falling slightly and closed at about 4.14%. Uh, crypto, I know it's a very risky thing. A lot of people don't like getting into it or maybe you do like getting into it. I don't know. I personally don't because it's too volatile, but it did surge to an all-time high valued at about 69,000. Uh, Ethereum was also up and Solana, it's a Kind of a cheaper coin, but it was also up about 25%. The whole crypto world and AI market are just surging right now. Uh, some stocks, some companies have come down a little bit, but for the most part, they're pretty high. Uh, here are just two graphs of Bitcoin and Ethereum. So you can see they climb, but like I said, they're pretty volatile. So there's a massive drop off and it's kind of hard to account for it, kind of hard to predict in the crypto world. Same with Ethereum, it, cr it crawls all the way up and then just crashes, but it, that one did bounce back a little bit better. 
Uh, then we have Target versus Walmart. So Target quarter four earnings came out on March 5th, uh, closing today at $173.54. So yesterday when the uh, quarter four report came out, the shares rose about 11% and they were over expected earnings. So investors were confident in the stock, meaning that more people were inclined to purchase it and the price went up. Uh, earnings were up about 57.8% from the last year. So they did pretty well. Uh, earnings per share was $2.98. And over the course of the year or course of the quarter, they made $31 and $31 billion. Uh, just to compare it to a competitor like Walmart, whose quarter four report came out last month, uh, their shows only rose about 5%, which also beat expected earnings. Uh, but obviously, Target is valued a lot more than Walmart just due to the nature of cap size, market value, revenue, things like that. And then, like we we're talking about with AI and technology, uh, Super Microcomputer, I'm sure you all have heard of it. It's a very trendy stock. Uh, I know for the market watch competition, it took me all the way from pretty much last up to fifth place. So I was pretty happy about that. Uh, their quarterly report, report came out as well. Their shares only rose by about $3.10. But as you can see from the top graph, uh, there was a huge spike. I know you can't see the day got cut off, but at the bottom, that's the day the report came out. So there's always a huge report if the company, not always, but there's usually a huge uh price increase if the company does well, because that displays investor confidence, that displays that the market's doing well in that sector. So overall, it's going to go up. Uh, on the other hand, you have a company like GitLab, who also had quarterly report come out on March 5th. Their shares rose by 4.38%. Earnings were up about a third from last year, but they have a negative earnings per share. And what that means is that the company is either spending more than they make, or they're just losing a lot of value very quickly. Uh, and the revenue, obviously, they're a lot smaller company than something like Super Microcomputer. But as you can see from their graph, their quarterly report, it tanked. They underperformed. So if a company underperforms, investors aren't very confident. Investors aren't very likely to invest in those companies. So usually when you have a strong report or you exceed expectations, you go up a lot. And like GitLab, if you have a pretty negative report or just not as good as you intended, it'll probably shoot down. Next, we have the economic perspective. So uh, something that came out today, I watched this morning, was the Fed, uh, Jerome Powell testified to Congress. Uh, the Fed wants inflation to be at about 2%. And the reasoning behind that is that they believe that 2% is a sweet spot for maximum employment and price stability. So that's giving consumers the ability to comfortably purchase goods and services, uh, overall contributing to a well-functioning economy. And it allows consumers like us to spend, borrow, and save and invest at a reasonable time without having to worry about high inflation, high interest rates, and other things. Uh, as you can see at the top, interest rates, or the Fed rates have not changed since about July, 2023. They stayed right about 5.33%. Um, and unemployment is at a historical low, according to Chair, uh, Chairman Powell. He said that new workers between the ages of 25 and 54 and a strong pace of immigration help with these numbers. So the workforce is growing, uh, but they are still a little bit shaky about inflation. They're still a little bit worried about but overall, they're happy with the way people just above our age group, for the most part, are going and returning to the workforce or joining the workforce. Uh, the chairman of the committee directly questioned him about what are you going to do with rates? How does it look for the future? What are things going to look for moving forward? And he said, I say it will depend on the path of the economy. Our focus is on maximum employment and price stability. So they're really trying to maximize the amount of employment they can have and the price stability to get down to that 2%. Uh, two percent rate that they're looking for for inflation, uh, and like I said, rates have unchanged. So we'll go over it on the next slide. But they're sitting between five point two five and five point five percent since July. And Powell also said that these rates are likely at their peak. So there's no he doesn't see any world where rates increase. There's no good, there's not going to be any rate hikes. But they're also waiting to do any rate cuts simply because of higher than wanted inflation uh, percentage. So this is a really quick breakdown of what the federal funds rate actually is. You probably hear about it all the time, but it may not be that clear as to what it actually is. So simply put, it is the rate at which commercial banks borrow and lend their excess reserves to each other overnight. Banks exchange money all the time. They're required to hold a certain amount of money in their bank and required to hold a certain amount at the Federal Reserve. If they have excess after holding it in the two locations, they're allowed to transfer that money between themselves uh, at this specific rate or percentage. So that's a quick graph of everything from about the 50s all the way to 2020. In the 1980s, uh, massive inflation. So there was things like the Iranian oil crisis, uh, government overspending. Jimmy Carter was in office at the time. 
and the self-fulfilling prophecy of higher prices leading to higher wages leading to higher prices. So if you want to increase wages, that means other things are probably going to go up, meaning that you're going to have to pay more for those things. And it's just a cycle. So everything kind of builds upon itself. And that was the policy that was going on in the 1980s. People thought, let's give people more money. Let's pay them more to come and work for us. And obviously, that's not sustainable for a long period of time if you have to keep raising prices on things and then raising the wages on top of that. Uh, so what does it affect? A lot. It affects anything from short-term interest rates, home and auto loans, credit cards, and more. A lot of people watch the Fed rate number, and that's how the market moves. So this week, probably going to be a bigger week than most because the Fed rate was announced, and then we'll also cover it later, but the jobs report is coming out. The jobs report is a really key element in a driver of the market. Uh, people look to see how unemployment was, how many people were employed, new workers, things like that. Um, we actually just did a paper in Professor Sweet's class about the jobs report. So that's also something that you should look at as well. It'll keep you very up to date with the market. And then that's just a little quick example of how the process would actually work. So if rates were to be cut even slightly, uh, the market might leap higher because companies have to, companies are charged less interest to borrow from the banks. Uh, really quick mergers and acquisitions. There was only one super interesting one I could find, and that is JetBlue and Spirit. So how many people heard about this merger? So yeah, uh, it's a pretty big deal. Starting all the way back in July of 2022, the two companies agreed to a merger. JetBlue was to acquire Spirit Airlines for about $3.8 billion. This agreement, if it had gone through successfully, would have led to the creation of the fifth largest air system uh, in the nation. Uh, but there were eight lawmakers that wrote a letter to the Department of Transportation and Justice Departments expressing concerns about the merger. Simply put, they were worried that it would decrease competition, meaning more prices that we would have to pay to get an airline ticket. So with the amount of competition available at the airlines, you can choose from Southwest, Delta, literally a bunch of airlines. If these two were to combine, that's one less airline on the market. That's one less place to buy a ticket. And we all know Spirit, they're known for really cheap prices and you just pay to get a bunch of stuff added on. So if this were to go away, that takes away more of a budget option for a lot of people. In March of last year, the U.S. filed a civil antitrust lawsuit to block JetBlue uh, acquiring Spirit Airlines for $3.8 Simply put, that means the U.S. didn't want this to happen. Uh, from the letter of the eight lawmakers, the U.S. courts thought and agreed with the lawmakers that we shouldn't eliminate this competition. Uh, I think the lawmakers thought that there needed to be this friendly competition to drive down the price of things like airline tickets. Uh, January of 2023, 2024, uh, was the termination of the agreement. So the U.S. District Court officially blocked the proposed JetBlue Spirit merger. And that's actually the first time in 20 years that the federal government rejected an airline merger. So really doesn't happen that often. But I believe they blocked another merger with Kroger and another company. I'm not, I don't remember which. Uh, but for the airline companies, this was the first time in 20 years. So a pretty rare thing to happen. Uh, but they are going to hear an appeal from the two companies. So there's still a possibility that it might happen. I personally think it's a little bit unlikely. The courts already ruled it's not allowed to happen. Uh, there's already lawmakers and legislation that would be against this happening. So I personally think it's unlikely. I know we're going kind of quick, but it is spring break, and this is an interesting topic. So I'm going to hand it over to Luke to cover artificial intelligence. So what I want to do is a very, very general little debriefing and uh, of AI. I want to introduce some uh, good thoughts to have and what to consider when thinking about this emerging technology. And then I'll open up a discussion. I'll have you all come down and uh, meet with an officer, form little groups, and I really want to hear what y'all's general consensus on AI is. So the technology itself is it's pretty complicated. I'm not too knowledgeable on the more technical aspects of it. If anyone knows like in depth how AI works and stuff like that, I'd be really interested here because I'm this. I see this technology like being very impactful. So. We're going to be focusing on like its inevitable implementation into the modern world. People's biggest fear is the job loss that will occur. So will your job be automated? Similar to like previous technological like revolutions and uh, like the industrial revolution, it eliminated the lower skill jobs. And I think that's what we're going to see a lot of. We're going to see a lot more, a lot less like data entry, a lot less 
lower skill work, like we're going to be moving towards the job market to be moving towards higher levels of thought and like deeper thinking. So what's interesting about AI and unlike previous um, revolutions in technology is that a lot of what we see is a lot of creative positions are going to be taken with AI. If you've seen um, OpenAI Sora or even like just writing uh, articles, news articles and stuff like that, and even graphic design, these jobs can be taken by AI for free. Like it's essentially free labor. It's recycling. It is in a way recycling um, previously made designs, but I don't think if you're a company and you're trying to make a logo, would you rather hire a really expensive like graphic designer or would you rather have, hey, AI, can you make me a nice logo with this kind of with these kind of characteristics? So we can start to look at the short term and long term impact. The short term impacts are a lot easier to gauge than long term impacts. And in the short term, the general consensus is that AI's integration into the work to all fields, really, is going to be like, if you look at the, the industry leaders in AI, their kind of goal is to make it make work more efficient it's kind of going to be like a work boost i don't know if you've heard of the concept of agents but an agent is essentially like it's on your computer you're like hey can you make me can you schedule me a doctor appoint, doctor's appointment on march 5th or something like that the ai will do it it has access to your phone it's going to go make a call it can and it can make a call with a voice and it will schedule its appointment completely autonomously it's insane it's crazy so you can see like some secretary work and work like that will start to uh, disappear and be replaced with um, AI. Now, the long term is where this technology starts to get scary in that the further away you look, it's the more uncertain things are, the more variables there are to consider. So some believe, and this is like, this is getting to like, um, not skepticism, but like, almost fear mongering is that AI will eventually get out of our hands. It could develop consciousness. It could become the super intelligent being that we won't be able to control, but that's all theory. And I do want to know what y'all think about that, but it is a lot of theory and a lot of variables and no one can say for sure. So uh, what's important when looking at our future is to see who is in charge of this technology. There are some big names in AI such as, um, Sam Altman, I've heard a uh, saying that Sam Altman is like the emperor of a new world or something like that. Um, there's Elon Musk, there's, um, I forget his name, it's like Andrew something. But there's all these big companies within AI. And um, what you'll find is there's a large asymmetry in knowledge and resources. And this this is a large part of what causes the, the concern in the long term. There are people in charge and what they do with this power is impactful how this extremely um, efficient and advanced technology is going to be utilized is going to be very impactful to, I'd say, just about everybody living. Like every living person this will affect within the next few years. So there's, there's also a counter argument, which is um, if you look at OpenAI's goal, their goal is to put power in the hands of the individual in that if you've seen Sora, like I referenced it earlier, its ability to generate videos and help with creative projects is going to allow more individual power. Like you yourself could create a movie with the right prompts. Like you could, you could create like a Marvel movie with the right prompts. And when this AI develops, so I'm really curious to see what y'all think of this, and I want to open up the discussion. Uh, we're going to have y'all come down here and um, form little groups with all the officers and it'll be about five minutes and then we'll go over some of what we discussed. I really want to see y'all's general consensus. Okay, so that's Asian groups, so we have six more groups, so we'll Hello. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, My group was focused more on the Way AI can be implemented to understand emotions. 
And uh, a lot of people are proud of that in which uh, they act as a family in which it's very just one of the zeros. But at the same time, a lot of uh, patterns are the same in terms of people uh, with writing emotions. And we're talking about how AI could possibly replace psychologists and psychiatrists. I mean, maybe this is just people are crazy, right? And now the robot is telling me, you need to go to You never know. Um, but we were saying how the way AI develops itself for a large society recognizes patterns. And in the same context, uh, emotions between different people. There are similar things that you see within different people. And we were saying that AI would recognize that and be able to replace psychologists. If they were able to like eventually. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Camille. I was in the middle of the college. And um, now that I volunteer to do this, I don't know if I can actually tell you what we spoke about. Um, so one of the main things that we spoke about was okay, so this is um, transition is artificial intelligence. And so we were asking the person, you know, when would this transition start? At some point, we need to start seeing it in schools. And Colin was explaining that it's, you know, he was teaching this to middle school kids. And so that's like kind of incredible that now your sixth and seventh grade students are going to know more than the people. So the other question is, uh, where are the universities going to start implementing that so like, we're not so far behind? Uh, the other question is, hey, where can we start? Because you know, most of us thought we are already starting from the reader. And he said, hey, can you just start teaching yourself maybe one thing at a time? Or you can just start from the when someone who are uh, Harvard is the courses they're free, you just kind of Google that and then they have like a Python course. And so maybe that's a place where you can start um it's free and um the other thing is sometimes you pay people to teach you something and you're not supposed to just teach yourself instead of paying for that. Mm -hmm. Um the other thing you brought up was how can AI maybe affect us as science majors and we believe that people will still want to talk to financial advisors or things like that. Yeah they have to probably make it easier or help us to explain better but um People when they're spending their money, they don't want to talk to somebody. So, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Luke. Uh, Arthur, we kind of just talked about, I guess, a, a little bit of what everyone else talked about. We talked about it's not completely ready, um, but I still think, you know, 20 years down the road, who knows where it's going to be, what the possibilities are. Um, uh, we also had talked about uh, just the need for regulations on AI. I don't know how exactly that would happen, but uh, deep fakes, especially there's scams involving AI and replicating voices of people, which I think is uh, just extremely dangerous to have uh, accessible to everybody. So, this in general, finding a way to regulate AI going on the next slide. So we were just saying uh, another big thing to talk about was how much more important data will be since AI will be the data. Uh, I mean, because the amount of data that will be used will determine how they make that decision and how they have to come from how they like, care and have problems for a right? Uh, if anyone else has any last minute things to say, y'all can. If not, that's also okay. I think it's really interesting how um, a lot of the consensus was regulation. And what's scary with that is that our trust in our government is like near an all-time low and nobody has faith in the people in charge. And 
right now is such an important time for them to act and to protect our humanity and to protect us as ind individuals. And it's just, I don't know, it's a scary thought to think that these people are who we're relying on to save us, essentially, from a, a poor future. All right, so let's give a round of applause to Luke for his AI presentation. Uh, I know it normally isn't something I cover, but I know Camille mentioned it, so I'll bring it up. Uh, what she's talking about is the Harvard Extension School. So Harvard offers like these free programs that you can look up. They have Python, coding, uh, finance, psychology. They have literally anything you can think of, and they have it for free. So sometimes it's a video lesson. Sometimes it's uh, like actual modules, discussion boards that you can go through. And they have a ton of stuff. Some of them you can even buy a certificate for. So it's a really good program to look into. Thank you for bringing it up. Uh, one last thing that I have before we move to the sweet spot is upcoming news. This week's a little bit slow, uh, but on Friday, the jobs report will come out. So like I mentioned earlier, we did a whole paper on this in Professor Sweet's class. Basically what this is, it gives you unemployment numbers, employment numbers, uh, the employment rate. And like I said earlier, markets react a lot to this information. So the S&P jumped quite a bit on last month's job report. Uh, depending on how the numbers come out, it might do the same this time. If you go to the Bloomberg terminal and put in the jobs report, it'll tell you the predicted numbers, the expected numbers. Uh, and then it'll show you once it comes out the adjusted rate and the actual rate. So overall, it's a really good thing to look into. And now I'll hand it over to Professor Sweet. My thought on AI is I don't think we have ever had a time in history where your boss is going to be more important in your company when you get your next first job. Um, one thing I noticed in my career is the generational when I came in, we all knew Excel, but our bosses didn't. And it gave us a huge advantage over them. That's no longer enough. So going forward, someone mentioned middle schools teaching AI. Think about what the people 10 years behind you are going to learn normally in middle school and high school. And you don't want them coming in and you feel like a dinosaur at 28 years old. That'd be pretty scary, wouldn't it? So I would encourage you, your first job, your boss better scare the life out of you. You better not have a boss that you're training after two weeks on the job because they can't do basic Excel. That's not what you want. You want a boss that scares the life out of you. My first boss in finance scared the life out of me. That's good. That's what you want. That would be my thought on AI. But anyway, I've, there was two articles in Economist asking, is the stock market in a bubble? And so I like when students go into interviews, I like you have a template. So like my investment class, they've got DC cuts I. Anybody remember that? So DC cuts I, you can talk about fixed income bucks. Anybody remember bucks? You can talk about stocks. Well, here's something. If you get a question, they say, hey, you think the stock market's in a bubble? Here's two articles. And what I did is I went through the articles and I highlighted in red things that were negative for stocks and in green that were positive. And you might take take out a piece of paper and do a column of positive and negative. So if they ask you that question, they don't want to hear yes as the answer or no as the answer. Uh, not to insult anybody, but they don't care what you think about the markets. What they care is how you think about the markets. All right. They don't want, you know, you're graduating school and say, like, oh, you think the stock market's doing well? I'm going to run and put all my money in stocks. That's not what they're looking for. Your thought process. And the thought process they want to hear is, Here's the pros for the market. Here's the negatives. Overall, this is what I think it means. So this gives you a template that they ask that question. So you might try to organize it, the pros and the cons, because there's some overlap in here. What are they saying is good for the market that we this market could keep just going and what's negatives? And so notice the first thing they mention is AI. And they say AI is unlikely to be the savior. Since 2010, the S&P has returned 11% per year. That's way too much. Stocks should give you a dividend year yield plus earnings growth. 11% is a lot higher than the number. All right, what are you noticing about the initial color? So what's the first thing they say? Interest rates are no longer 0%. Why did the stock market up 11%? Well, part of that is because interest rates have fallen so much. Can that happen again? Well, kind of, we're at you know, 4%, but 
Can we can we have interest rates go from 18% to 4% again? That's not gonna happen. That's the first thing, no more free money. Trade war is started. What drove earnings the last 20 years? Open trade with, with China, open trade around the world, even Russia and other countries, that's going away. We're having more wars, big wars. So you got Ukraine, you got the Middle East, you might have China, Taiwan. Those are scary things. We had some really quiet 90s and 80s and 90s of very few major conflicts. Governments are turning away from free markets and globalization. We just talked about that, declining the spirit. Um, JetBlue merger, talk about regulation of AI. Governments are becoming anti, and it, and it used to be Republicans pro-business, Democrats anti-business. Now it's Republicans anti-business, Democrats anti-business. It's like everybody hates business. Why? Because everybody hates success. Um, protectionism is coming back. How many have we gotten up to so far? The bubble's waiting to pop, especially in America, on Wall Street, multiples. So you got a market that looks expensive versus history. That's another negative for markets. They're 90% as high as they were. Um, the dot com mania. That was when we knew the stock market was expensive. We're not too far from that level. That's kind of scary. Also, this market has risen, but it's been driven by a few big names. So we don't have much breadth. That's a negative. The spread, the valuation, the most expensive companies versus the cheapest, that's really wide, which means this market is being driven by just a few names. The value of the top 10 American firms proportionate to the rest of the market has is really, really high. We've not seen that before. All right, do y'all wanna see some green or y'all wanna be more depressed, all right? There are reasons for exuberance. That This exuberance is rational. Who came up with the word exuberance? Good old Alan Greenspan. So uh, irrational exuberance. At the start of 2023, they predicted we're gonna have this massive recession, but we haven't had it. So the economy is doing a lot better than people thought. So that gives you some confidence. A broad range of firms are publishing, firms are making a lot of money. No question. Microsoft is making a lot of money. Apple is making a lot of money. NVIDIA is making ridiculous amounts of money compared to just a year ago. So the economy keeps doing extremely well. All right, more red. What's the big red here? China's not doing. China drove a lot of growth for 20 years, and now China is really struggling. But overall, the IMF is saying, while China is a big negative, India is doing great, other countries are doing great, Japan is starting to do really well. And then we do have artificial intelligence since that's gonna save the world. Oh, some more green. Techno optimism. In some quarters, bullishness about the economy-wide productivity growth. That you just talked about that. Luke just talked about productivity growth. Can AI make us much more wealthy? But we tend to get overly optimistic. So AI is probably going to have impacts much more slow, much slower than we thought. That's been true of just about everything else. Yeah, AI is going to hit, but it's not going to hit. So if you think about the two thousand. 2000 crash at dot com. It wasn't that the market was wrong. All the things they were expecting happened. It's just that it took it 20 years instead of two years. And so we got way ahead of ourselves, crashed, and then it came back. Um, today's investors may struggle to pick which companies, so which are going to win the AI war. We're having that same battle with electronic vehicles too, right? Which company is going to win the EV battle? Um, so back into dot com. Everybody's betting that everybody was going to win and everybody didn't win. And then did you pick the ones that actually won? And a lot of people didn't. And they lost a lot of money. All right, more red, sorry. The trend of rising profits. So if another thing you can talk about is, well, corporate earnings as a percentage of our economy are really, really high. It's the corporations, and that may be one reason why legislatures are going to battle this. Corporations are too big part of our economy. We're going to have to cut them back and make, you've heard, you know, Biden saying these corporations are ripping us off and charging too much and taking advantage. You know, you get some pretty negative political flack here. And you can't just keep borrowing money cheap and paying low taxes. 
that can't go on forever. You can't cut tax rates to negatives. So we've had a lot of tailwinds that can't get any better. And so now they become headwinds. That's just simply their argument. The fall can't be repeated. The fall in interest rates, the fall in tax rates, that can't be repeated and might actually be reversed. What can you say about tax rates? What do we know about most countries in the world? Are they drowning in debt? Or are they overflowing with positive cash flows? How many countries have uh, government uh, surpluses right now? Can you name a country with a government surplus? Japan might be the worst. The U.S. I love it when they talk about third world countries with you know ninety percent debt to GDP, when the U.S. is higher than they are, and you think, wow, this poor country, they're too much debt. Uh, kind of scary, but yeah, it's hard to think we're going to be cutting tax rates when we have these massive debts. Um, the second article. Everywhere you look, stocks are breaking records. Everything's hitting a new record. That may not be necessarily bad. The S&P 500, Europe, even Europe, as bad as it's been trailing the U.S. Nikkei just hit 40,000, which still amazes me. It took them 34 years to get back to where they were before. The global stock market index hit an all-time high here recently. The MSCI World Stock Market Index includes the U.S. It just hit an all-time high. So even with, with China doing badly, Everything else is offsetting it. You, however you measure it, American returns have outclassed everywhere else. The U.S. has been the place to be. 60% of Americans now own stocks. That's the most since the data has been collected. Many of them have a question, is the stock market surge sustainable? A chorus of academics and market research argues that it would be tough for American firms to deliver the long-term growth. So the stock market is all about earnings growth. And earnings growth is all about what? Anybody took my investment class. To get earnings growth, you need economic growth. All right. So we've had these great earnings growth, and actually the US pretty decent economic growth, especially here recently. So if you can keep the stock market going, you got to keep these earnings growth going. But these earnings growths have been really helpful by some unsustainable things. The tailwinds I'm talking about are unlikely to keep going because valuations are already pretty expensive. Robert Siller, all of his stuff is free out there. The cyclically adjusted, I brought, this wasn't actually in the article, but I brought it in. This is the Siller report. I don't know if you've ever seen this. The red line is the bond market. When it's low, bonds are expensive. You notice bonds are not expensive anymore. Bonds are a pretty decent investment now, which is not good for stocks because people can buy bonds and make pretty good returns. The blue line is the stock market. When it's high, stocks are expensive. So he kind of has it flipped. Bonds are expensive when the line's low. Stocks are expensive when the line's high. You notice the 1929 market crash. Stocks are more expensive today than it was before that crash. They're not as expensive before the dot-com crash, but they're pretty expensive from a historical standpoint. So it's at 34.3. Rarely have corporate profits been valued so highly. So the market's really expecting. I did my own chart where I compared PE ratios, which shows you how expensive, you know, a higher PE ratio, the more expensive stocks are, versus inflation. And here's where we are right now. We're well above that line. So when you adjust for inflation, stocks look exp extremely expensive. Um, we already talked about that. GDP versus corporate profits are really, really high. Yet much of the strong performance is a mirage. Politicians have reduced tax burdens. Meanwhile, over the same period, borrowing became cheaper. That's back to the same thing again. We find that America, the difference in profit growth between the 62-89 period and 89-2019 is entirely due to, they say that all of this profit growth that we've had this last couple of decades is lower interest rates, lower tax rates. It's not because management's doing a better job, they're more profitable, it's all those two things. All right, that's kind of scary. They have a serious problem, all that's gonna reverse. Our analysis of 142 countries that the median statutory tax rate is starting to go back up. Now, if Trump gets elected, he's talking about cutting rates again, but can he actually do it with the deficit? You know, those are the kind of questions you have to ask. You know, how many politicians are gonna run on higher tax rates? They may hire, run on higher corporate tax rates. Have you heard of politicians running on higher personal tax rates? Maybe just for the wealthy, but 
So again, AI is going to rescue us from all of that. And then very end, needless to say, this is a heavy burden for technology to carry all of this weight and make everything wonderful again. Companies face an uncertain geopolitical climate, global trade, declining. Um, both parties are, yeah, Republicans and Democrats, everybody's piling in on, on corporate America. The battle against inflation still has more work to do. A lot of negatives. So if you go into an interview and they ask you the stock overpriced, over, underpriced, you don't want to get a definitive answer on one side. You want to say, here's the pros, here's the con, but overall, I think this. Because they, they want to make sure you can see both sides of the, the equation, right? So um, if y'all want this article, let me know. I'll put it out there somewhere. I'll, I'll like, leave it then. They can put it out there. So anyway, that's it for me. Thank you, Professor Sweet. All right. Now we're going to go over kind of you know what we have in store for not next week, next week's spring break. Any applause for that spring break? Y'all happy? So uh, I will have Adrian come up here in a bit. Uh, next week after spring break, the week after spring break, uh, we will have uh, the SWBC come over for our general meeting. And I'll pass it off to Adrian right now, kind of give you know a little update on that. All right, I'll be uh, putting tweet today. Uh, so if you're not familiar, SWBC uh, Southwest Business Corporation, they're headquartered here in San Antonio. Uh, and they're one of the bigger um, investment firms um, in town. So we're happy that we're gonna be able to uh, bring them in. Uh, the VP of Investment Services will be coming in. His name is Chris Albrecht. Uh, we also have someone else that may uh, be coming with him. Uh, so just um, you know, keep up with our, our uh, announcements on that. Um, but the, the main reason why um, I wanted to come up here is to share, they actually asked me to start putting it out there to our community first before it goes out um, and through other avenues. They have a position that they're uh, looking for in the investment services division. Uh, the roles are called capital markets trading assistant. Um, and it's compared to um, working at like a Wall Street firm, like you're going to be like on a kind of trading floor environment. So uh, for those that are interested in that uh, position, uh, come see me after and I can, uh, I'll basically forward on your resume on uh, to Chris Elbrick. So that way, when you, you guys come to the meeting, uh, you can actually speak to him in person about it and maybe he'll already know your name and that kind of thing. Uh, they are gonna have other uh, positions come up for the summer and the fall, but this is the one that's already official. Uh, so just wanted to make you guys aware of that if anyone's interested in that. Again, it's called uh, Capital Markets Trading Assistant. It'll be on site at the SWBC headquarters, which is off the four, off of 410. It's sort of near the airport, uh, right? It's on San Pedro. On San Pedro. Yeah, off, off, on San Pedro. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, I think it's a great firm. They've been, they've spoken, um, they've, we've done an event with them before and it was, it was a Pretty great one. Um, and so uh, I just encourage everyone to come out and enjoy your spring break. Everybody, I know a few of you shared uh, that you had cool plans for spring break, but yeah, enjoy it. All right. And for those that are interested, kind of a little resume workshop, we're going to have it the day before. So Tuesday, uh, I don't know why I have five, you know, March is in fifth, is it? But yeah, we're having 19, uh, Tuesday at 4 p.m., uh, the week that we come back, you know, scan it if you want to get your workshop. Uh, Jada and one of our other officers will be helping out you all in, you know, what what employers look for a resume, uh, type of format that you should be looking into as well, and kind of just, you know, essentially passing it over, seeing like, hey, you know, does this look decent or does this decently worded? So if y'all want y'all are interested in that as well, you know, scan the QR code. And for the SWC meeting, we will have some snacks. Is that Yeah, I can think for five. What is that, June? May? May, yeah. It is not May. And once again, for graduating seniors, uh, scan it. That way we can have, you know, like your slideshow at the end of the semester. And then see if you qualify for a stole, one of our stoles.
All right. And then market watch updates. I have done so poorly in the market watch. I've just been going down, down, down. But hopefully y'all are doing good. Uh, John Hernandez, Miguel Gutierrez, and Pablo Martinez. Congratulations for second and third. Is anyone one of y'all in here? Both, both. Awesome. Oh let's see. Let's hope that y'all can keep 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 the first and second and third till till April twenty fourth. Society merch. We're always selling our polos and our t-shirts. T-shirts for twenty and our polos twenty five for non members. Twenty four members. Always here, you know, meet up Nima, meet up with Nima to purchase a shirt as well as pay for your dues. You will need your dues to enter the formal. And anyway, hope you guys enjoy your spring break. Uh, that's it from us. We wish you all a happy spring break. Stay safe. Don't do anything too crazy. I remember always in moderation. Y'all have a good one.